Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. Thank you for coming out on Easter weekend and spending your Sabbath with us here at Central Hills. I hope you'll all be blessed and inspired with today's message, which sort of is a Easter message, but sort of isn't. But you'll kind of we'll kind of put it together as we go along. It's entitled "Love or Destruction," and it's actually going to be a two-part series. I'll be preaching the second part um, two weeks from today. Um, and the reason for that is I'd rather preach two short sermons and one rather than one long sermon. I didn't learn much when I was in college, and that's my own fault. But one thing I remember learning from a professor was the mind can only learn what the buck can endure. <laughs> and that phrase has always stuck with me. And so I don't overdo it. Um, but that being said, let me tell you a story about John Robert Fox, who was born in Cincinnati, Ohio in the year 1915. Like other African Americans in the United States, Fox had to navigate a world of prejudice and segregation. After high school, he attended college at Ohio State University, but later transferred to Wilberforce University, which was a historically black school. Fox participated in ROTC, studied science, and graduated in 1941 with a degree in engineering and received a commission as second lieutenant in the U.S. Army. Due to the Army's policies, Fox was forced to join the segregated 92nd Infantry Division. He trained with this division as a forward observer with the 598th Artillery Battalion. And as a forward observer, Fox served on the front lines where he would call in um, airstrikes on enemy positions. While the men of the 92nd trained, Army leadership debated whether they were even going to allow black soldiers to serve in combat. But this all changed in 1944 when the di uh, division deployed to Italy. As soon as the 92nd uh, division arrived, they experienced heavy fighting and harsh conditions. Though the division saw high casualties, they continued to push up the Italian coast against the Germans. And by December 1944, the 92nd reached the Circhio River Valley near a town in Italy called Soma Colonia. It was on Christmas Day, 1944, when German troops snuck into the town, camouflaged in civilian clothing. By the next morning, the Germans had basically overrun the city and began an attack on all U.S. positions. U.S. forces decided that they must retreat because of the heavy incoming artillery from the Germans. Fox, though, was not a part of that withdrawal. He uh, remained behind on the second floor of a house where he coordinated uh, defensive fire protecting the retreating troops. Fox reported that the Germans were on the streets and they were attacking in great strength. Though the Germans continued to push forward, Fox held his position radioing artillery strikes as German troops continued to move closer and closer. He radioed his battalion commander, that was just where I wanted it, he said. Bring it in 60 yards, was the next radio command. His commander argued that the bombardment would be too close to his position. Germans continued to press forward, surrounding his position, and despite the danger to himself, Fox repeated his call for artillery fire. The last communication from Fox was, fire it, there's more of them than there are of us. Fox was killed by the very artillery fire that he had called for. He bravely sacrificed his life to protect his <coughs> battalion. Approximately 100 Germans were also killed in that artillery exchange. Fox's sacrifice delayed the enemy offensive, allowing retreating soldiers to regroup. And in just a few short days, Americans were able to recapture the Italian town of, the Italian town of Somo Polinia. Fox was a man who sacrificed his life for his unit and for his country, a country that treated him unfairly due to the segregationist principles that were in effect 
at the time. And as we celebrate Easter this weekend, I want us all to reflect on another man who sacrificed for people who treated him unfairly, for people who didn't appreciate him and what he was doing. A man who sacrificed for the entire world. I'm referring, of course, to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus loved us so much that he endured the cross on Good Friday nearly 2,000 years ago for each of us. A true sign of love. But he didn't stay in the tomb. He rose that Easter Sunday morning, which should give each and every one of us encouragement and hope that when this life is all over, we too will rise to eternity. Jesus Christ, Lieutenant Fox, two great examples of love. And as we look throughout society, sometimes we tend to see that love is everywhere. One of Shakespeare's most famous playwrights is a book or a play that actually turned into a book called Romeo and Juliet, which I'm sure we've all heard of, which tells of the romance between two very young people from feuding families. It's a story about falling in love. Anyone in here grew up listening to Elvis Presley? <laughs> With the exception of a song called All Shook Up, no song is more associated with Elvis than Love Me Tender, which Elvis recorded in 1956. The chorus in that song goes something like this, Love me tender, love me true, all my dreams fulfilled, for my darling, I love you, and I always will. And then there's Valentine's Day, which we just celebrated last month, when lovers express their affection with overpriced gifts and greetings and dinners and flowers. <laughs> Love is also found, though, quite regularly in the scriptures. Let me give you just a few examples. So God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And then Paul tells us in Romans, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels nor principalities nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Jacob served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed only a few days to him because of the love that he had for her. And then Solomon wrote, Many waters cannot quench love, nor can the floods drown it. If a man would give for love all the wealth of his house, it would be utterly despised. Solomon were alive today with words like that. Hallmark would have hired him to be a uh, card writer. We see lots of examples of love in the scriptures. But what about destruction? The opposite of love. Turn in your Bibles to 1 Samuel 15.3. I want us to look at the passage. 1 Samuel 15, 3. I'll give you a second to turn there. 1 Samuel 15, chapter, verse 3. Now go and attack Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and do not spare them. But kill both man and woman, infant and nursing child, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Through the prophet Samuel, God commanded Saul to kill them all. To kill adults, to kill children, to kill babies, to kill animals. And then there is the flood before that time where God basically did the same thing where he wiped humanity off the face of the planet. Where is the love of God? How do we reconcile passages like these? You know, atheists really love these types of scriptures because it allows them to say things like, See, I told you God is an uncaring, unloving, horrible tyrant. But the Bible says that God is love. So can he be both? And the answer is a resounding 
Yes. I'm okay when people ask these types of questions about God and their faith because it shows that people are thinking through their beliefs and their faith in God. So these types of questions are normal and they're appropriate if you've ever thought that about God. So how can God be both? In regard to the Amalekites, we actually have to go back to the book of Genesis to answer this question. Remember the story of Esau and Jacob? They were twin brothers. And we all remember when Jacob and his mother Rachel conspired to trick uh, Isaac to steal the birthright from Esau. We all remember that story, right? What was Esau's descendants who would become known as the Amalekites, named after their leader Amalek. And they would constantly attack the children of Israel. They were the proverbial, the thorn in your side. You all remember the famous battle in which Moses stood at the mountaintop with his arms raised up, and as long as his arms were up, they would win, but as soon as his arms were lowered, they would lose. You know who they were fighting? The Amalekites. After Moses died, Joshua took over the leadership of Israel and took the children into the Promised Land. Joshua defeated, guess who? The Amalekites after entering the Promised Land. But the children of Israel would fight against them for a long time. There was a reason that God wanted them destroyed. Israel, of course, God's chosen people at the time, their survival depended on their safety and their security. Think about it. This was the nation that the Messiah would be coming from. And as long as the Amalekites were around, Israel was not safe. God was not about to let the Amalekites interfere with his plans to bring forth the Messiah from this special nation. The Amalekites, they were far from being upstanding citizens. After several thousand years of perfecting sin, they became profoundly, profoundly wicked. But couldn't God just change their hearts? Oftentimes, isn't that the question? Can't God just change people's hearts and not cause people to be so wicked? God doesn't force anyone to change their hearts. And Pharaoh is the perfect example of God giving people multiple chances, ten chances, of course, without forcing people to change. Plus, the Amalekites already knew all about God, so that wasn't an excuse. They knew about the miracles he performed, especially when um, uh, the exodus from Egypt. They knew that God was with Israel, and yet they refused to change their ways. They chose to be rebellious and unrepentant. They chose that. Some people may think that the Amalekites weren't all that bad. That maybe they were just like uh, those annoying neighbors you have, people who maybe drink a little too much, or smoke a little bit of weed, or play their music a little too loudly after hours. But that wasn't the case. The Amalekites were ruthless, wicked people. That's why God wanted them gone. Their influence was too great, they would never change, and the earth was polluted with their evil. The planet was better off without them. The destruction of the Amalekites was further proof that God was, in fact, Israel's God. This had nothing to do with God's hatred or anger against anyone. Rather, it has to do with God's love. God knew that the Amalekites would never, prevent, uh, would, would never repent and they were better off gone. What about God's destruction of the world during the flood? Let me share with you a couple of passages from Genesis chapter 7 that talk about the flood. It says, I will destroy from the face of the earth all living things that I have made. On that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, and the windows of heaven were opened. And the waters prevailed exceedingly on the earth, and all the high hills under the whole heaven were covered. And all flesh, all flesh, died that moved on the earth. Birds and cattle and beasts and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth and every man. 
So he destroyed all living things which were on the face of the ground, both man and cattle, creeping thing and bird of the air. They were destroyed from the earth. Only Noah and those who were with him in the ark remained. That was a sample of verses taken from Genesis chapter 7. I want you to ponder on those verses for a minute and consider the scale of God's destruction for a minute. Think about that. And now let me share with you what 1 John 4, 8 says. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. So how do we reconcile that? The flood occurred approximately 1,600 years after the earth was created. So you think 1,600 years of um, population growth? At least had to be a couple of million people on the earth, right? After 1,600 years, I would say. So millions died except for eight. Yes, God killed them all, but God is love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. We love him because he first loved us. Destroying the world was an act of love. Let me repeat that. When God destroyed the world, that was an act of love. It couldn't have been easy for God to do that. It must have brought immense pain and suffering to his heart. But some people can't get past God being a tyrant. So let's recap for a minute. God created this perfect world. He created humanity to live in a perfect environment where it was a Probably a lot like being in Fiji. 80 degrees, beautiful waters, beautiful, plentiful uh, fruits. But Adam and Eve, they chose to sin. And then Cain murdered his brother. And then he lied about it. Cain then showed no remorse. And his heart remained hardened, like Pharaoh. Then Cain's descendants would come along, and they would introduce polygamy into the world. You see where I'm going? You see the cycle of one thing after another after another as the world becomes more and more wicked with no end in sight? Every sin was being practiced by people who had no desire to serve God. So the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Genesis 6.5 and then in verse 11, it says, The earth also is corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So in just those two verses, Moses tells us, uses these three adjectives to describe the condition of man. Wicked, evil, violence. Noah preached for 120 years, and only his family joined him. The world was thoroughly wicked, and God was more than patient. God knew that he had to start over after 120 years of patience. He knew there would be people who would come along who would serve him and who would actually welcome and worship his son. Only if he could protect them from the extreme wickedness, though, that now existed. It wasn't hate. It wasn't cruelty. It was love. I think that we would all agree that wicked people are better off being gone. It's easy to say that God is an evil tyrant because he destroyed the world, but not so. In two verses in Genesis, it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And then it goes on to say, Then the Lord said to Noah, Come into the ark, you and all your household, because I have seen that you are righteous before me in this generation. Would an evil God, God call someone righteous or extend grace unto them? <clears throat> an angry God wouldn't have built a giant ship to save people if he were a tyrant who takes pleasure in destruction. It was an abundance of sin and wickedness that compelled God to hit the reset button. These stories were preserved to be a lesson for all of us and for all generations. And that's because another global destruction is coming. And 
just like Noah turned to God and got on the ark, God is hoping that we turn to Him to be saved. So, how do you view God's love in your life? Everything that God has done has been out of love, including the destruction of cities and people. When we accuse God of being tyrannical, it shows our lack of understanding the big picture. I spoke earlier about Valentine's Day, which really has nothing to do with the Bible. Oftentimes when we think of Valentine's Day, we, we imagine caricatures of uh, little chubby angels, right, wearing no shirts, and you can see their little cute little back rolls as they hold their bow and arrow, right? Um, these are pictures uh, that actually depict the Roman God of love. But thankfully, though, God's love is more than just once a year. His love is constant and never fails. In the book of Lamentations, a book we don't really read from very often, it says, through, um, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because His compassions fail not. That's right. God's compassion for you never fails. But many people don't know the love of God. They've had bad experiences in life. They've suffered physical or emotional abuse, divorce, poverty, job loss, incarceration maybe, and some of their own bad decisions have led to some of these things. But regardless of what has happened to you, God's compassion never fails. So how have you seen the love of God revealed in your life? Has God blessed you with good health, with a loving family, with employment and financial stability, with a nice home or apartment or townhouse, a good functioning reliable car? Yes, all those things are a sign of God's love. But let me ask you this. What if you lost your job, or your car broke down, or your house burned down, or your spouse left you, or you got cancer, or your church building project wasn't going as planned? Would that mean that God no longer loves you? You see, if you hang your hat on those things, you'll have an up and down faith because you'll only have a good relationship with God when you have the things you want and you'll have a bad relationship with God when the things aren't going your way. So if you look at the blessings only for your relationship with God, it's going to be like a roller coaster with constant ups and downs. So here's how you know that God loves you. It's what He did nearly 2,000 years ago for us on that Good Friday. It's Calvary. The cross was God's greatest demonstration of love ever. He did what was necessary to show that all of heaven loves you. Turn with me to Romans 5, verse 8, as we prepare to wrap up. Romans 5, verse 8. This was part of our scripture reading. Romans 5 verse 8 says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is love. Jesus died a cruel and hideous death for us, to give us hope and a certainty of eternity. That is love. When you look at the cross, hopefully you see that love for you. And what should your response be? We loved him because he first loved us. Satan wants you to believe that despite the cross, God is a cruel tyrant. The real truth, however, is that God is love. Yeah. As you go home today and enjoy the rest of your Easter weekend, I want you to take time to read the scriptures and reflect upon Calvary and resurrection morning.
Take some time to read those passages this weekend and reflect on the great love that God has for you. That despite the ups and downs in your life, the employment, the unemployment, the health, the poor health, that God sent His Son Jesus, which is how He shows us that He truly loves us. At this time, let's go ahead and stand and sing our closing hymn.